Well, good morning. Um, thank you for, for being here. Those of you who are joining us online, thank you so much for, for making us a part of your weekend. Now, I am, I'm always excited whenever I get these opportunities to, to speak to you guys, but uh, today I am especially excited uh, for a couple of reasons. One, my grandparents are here. Well, my grandpa decided coffee was more important, but grandparents are here, uh, and this the, if, I, if memory serves me, this is the first time they've ever heard me preach. Uh, so that should be, I'm going to do my best not to mess it up, um, no pressure or anything, but, uh, but on top of that, it's also extra special because today is my beautiful bride's second 29th birthday. She's shaking her head, she's red in the face, she's very upset with me, but you know, say la vie, what are you going to do? Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, being in the world, but not of the world, but you are my world, and I love you, so happy birthday. So, dang, I'm so, I'm so sweet. Gosh, take notes, fellas. I am, the, I am just the sweetest of guys. I was just curious how long you guys were going to ooh and all over that. We're going to keep going. All right, so before we get to today's text, I want to take a moment and just sort of remember where we're at. We are walking through John chapter 17, which is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Now, generally, Scripture records that Jesus prayed, but it doesn't give us what he prayed. It doesn't give us the content. Uh, John 17 is an exception to that rule. So not only do we get to see how Jesus prayed, but we actually get to see what he prayed and the content of his prayers. In this case, this is a prayer for us. So Jesus opens with a few lines about and for himself, and then he transitions to a prayer for his followers. Now, this would have included those gathered around him in the moment, but it also extends to all of his followers throughout history. And there is something very, very comforting about Jesus praying for us the night he was arrested. It shows that he didn't wait until his resurrection and ascension to start making intercession for us before the Father. He went ahead and got a head start, like an overachiever. And now generally, when you call someone overachiever, it's a little tongue-in-cheek, but the man created the universe. Uh, I think overachiever is a pretty good title for him. So uh, last week, to bring it in a little bit closer, uh, Pastor Brock walked in depth through verse 13, uh, talking about what it means to have Jesus' joy. Now, we looked at Nehemiah 8.10, uh, which says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, we talked about how, generally speaking, pulling verses out of context, real bad idea, don't do that. Uh, however, in this case, with the joy of the Lord is your strength, it doesn't really matter what context you put that in, it always means what it means. You can't twist this one uh, simply by pulling it out of context. However, because we're translating uh, from Nehemiah, Nehemiah, we're translating Hebrew to English, uh, we have a tendency to, to stress the wrong part of that phrase. We like to, to stress the word joy, like, yeah, we'll take the joy, big fan of the joy, give me the joy, when in all reality, the, the primary focus of that statement is of the Lord. Uh, because joy comes from the very nature and person of God, without of the Lord, we don't get joy. So even though we can't really mess it up out of context, we can mess it up by stressing the wrong point of, of the verse. So that's just a recap. I'm not going to get real deep into verse 13 because Pastor Brock did that last week. And so if you've forgotten or you haven't had a chance to, to watch or listen to that sermon yet, I'd encourage you to, to do that this afternoon. It's on the website and go, go get caught up. Um, because we like to just simply walk through Scripture as it is written, today we're going to pick up right where we left off. So we're going to be in John chapter 17, starting in verse 14. Uh, it's going to be on the screen behind me. If you're watching online, it should be on the bottom of your screen as well. It says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. You know, I've titled this sermon, In It, Not Of It. And I've done that because most of us, again, have heard the phrase, in the world, but not of the world. Now, that phrase doesn't actually appear anywhere in Scripture. Okay? 
But the sentiment and the idea behind that phrase is true and it's taken directly from this passage. Before we get into the in the world, not of the world part, let's actually go back and just look at the very start of verse 14. Jesus says, I have given them your word. He is not talking about Old Testament scripture here. Okay, Old Testament scripture is very important, right? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So all of scripture is important. And so while Old Testament scripture is hugely important and necessary and good and, and worthy to study, in this moment, Jesus is talking specifically about his teaching and more broadly about his life. Now, this can be understood to be a reference to Jesus being the incarnate word of God, which calls us back to John 1.1 1, 1 and John 1.14, where he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then skip to verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. These are both uh, references to Jesus himself. So, when Jesus says he has given us God's word, it can be understood that he gave us both his literal words of knowledge and instruction, but also in a metaphorical sense, he gave us all of who he is. He gave us himself, his very being. So when he says, I have given them your word, he's given us instruction, he's given us teaching, and he's given us himself. Now what happens when he gives us his word? The end of verse 14, which reads, And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. That's admittedly less comforting. Right? No one likes the idea that we're hated. Right? Human nature dictates that we all want to find acceptance. We all desire to be accepted. This is why a fear of rejection is listed as some of the top-tier fears of every demographic across the board. No one likes to feel rejected. We all want to feel as if we belong. So when Jesus outright says the world will hate us, nay, it already hates us, that's disconcerting. We are not big fans of being hated. However, this should not catch us off guard. Right? Jesus talked about it just a few chapters ago in chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. If the world hates you, know it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would have loved you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, what's the, the common trope during a breakup? Like, oh, it's not me. Well, it's not you, it's me. It's not you, it's me. I'm sorry, i got to work on me. Yeah, that's not, that's not how this goes. Uh, the world says to us here, uh, it's not us, it's you. Right? It's not us. Uh, we, don't, we don't dislike you because of us. We dislike you because of you. And let's not pretend that the whole, like, it's not, it's not you, it's me. Is, it's just so pandering and pedantic. It's just mean. But the world has said, it's not us, it's you. You are the problem. So we shouldn't be surprised because this pattern is nothing new. But this pattern of the unbeliever hating the believer did not start with the world hating us. The pattern of the unbeliever hating the believer did not even start with Jesus and the Pharisees and the religious leaders. This pattern of the unbeliever hating the believer goes all the way back to Cain hating Abel to the point of murder with a rock. Abel's Offering was accepted by the Lord because it was a proper offering. And Cain's was not accepted because he did not give of his first fruits. He did not give the best of what he had. He gave the afterthought. And because God did not accept Cain's offering, Cain became enraged, not at God, but at Abel. And he hated Abel to the point where he killed his own brother. So this, this pattern of the unbeliever hating the believer goes all the way back to one generation outside of the garden. There's nothing new about this. So we have no excuse for being caught off guard about the world hating us. The world hates the believer because the believer is no longer a citizen of the world. We are told that our citizenship, the moment Jesus saves us, is transferred from the world to the kingdom of heaven. 
We become citizens of heaven who are sojourning in the world, living abroad, and this world does not like immigration. This world does not like the outsider. And that's exactly what we've become. We've, we've forfeited our citizenship of the world to become citizens of heaven, and yet we remain in the world. And the world is not a fan. And this actually brings us to verse 15, where Jesus says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. How many of us have ever had the thought, like, gosh, it would just be so much easier if Jesus would save us and then just bring us home? Wouldn't that be easier? It would save us so much pain and so much heartache. Anybody else had that thought ever? Just me? Okay, cool. A couple of you? Good. Well, here's the thing. That absolutely would be easier. You're right. But if you hang out around Crossroads for more than about three and a half minutes, you're going to hear a very common phrase. We do hard things. Well, so it would be easier. Absolutely. But if Jesus saved us and then immediately took us home, who would be left to share the good news of the gospel? Who would be left to preach? Who would be left to feed the hungry? Who would be left to shelter the orphan? Who would be left to care for the sick? Who would be left to comfort the hurting? Who would be left to give guidance and direction to the lost and the confused? Right? We love the analogy of being the hands and the feet of Jesus, but if Jesus immediately took us all home, he would have no hands and feet. There would be no body of believers, and for whatever reason, I don't understand it because it makes no sense to me, but I'm not God, and I've made peace with that. Jesus has decided to use his people to spread his gospel. Again, to me, that seems wildly inefficient, but I'm not God. So Jesus does not pray for the Father to take us out of the world because this is not the plan he has for us as believers. Our place and role as believers during our lifetimes is not to withdraw or separate ourselves from the world. Our place and role is to remain in the world so that we may influence the world and point the world toward Jesus while influencing it for good. Our place and role is to stay in this hostile kingdom of which we are not citizens and work to reach the citizens of this kingdom for the kingdom of heaven. We have a role, and it requires that we stay here. The primary goal of our salvation is not to save us. And I know that seems controversial on the face of it. And you might even, like, be planning your pitchforks for this heretic. So I'm going to say it again. The primary goal of our salvation is not to save us. The primary goal of our salvation is to bring God glory. We've talked about how God is all about his glory, and saving us brings him glory. Therefore, the primary goal of our salvation is to bring God glory. Beyond that, the primary goal or the the goal of our salvation is to become kingdom agents who are used by the Holy Spirit to point others to Jesus. Much like scripture is not about you, but it's about Jesus, your salvation is not about you. It's about Jesus and about bringing God glory. And if Jesus were to pluck us out and and bring us home the moment he saved us, our lives could not bring him glory because our lives have ended, or at least our lives in this world. So what's left there to bring God? There's nothing left. This is is the way he's designed it and chosen for it to be from the beginning. So as believers, we can't do our job and fulfill our role properly if we remove ourselves entirely from the world around us. If Jesus is not going to bring us home, why should we sequester ourselves? Again, while we know that the phrase, in the world but not of the world, is not in Scripture, the truth of it is here. It's found in Scripture, and it's, and it's real. And we can't say that we're in the world and not of the world if we're not in the world. We have to find ourselves in the world if we want to have any hope of reaching the world around us for the gospel or with the gospel. We have to be mindful of ourselves, however, that while we are in the world trying to reach the world with the gospel, that we don't fall victim to the temptations that are in the world. There's two sides to this. Galatians 6.1 says it like this, Brothers, If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, read the believer, 
should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We are called to minister to the world and to point them to Jesus. Doing that will require that we engage a world that doesn't know Jesus and acts like it. Right, this means two things. First, we do not get to go, oh, excuse me, we do not not get to go and tell people about Jesus because we don't want to get too close. We don't get to not go because we don't want to get their scent on us. We don't want to get their smell on us. We don't want to be around those people for a number of reasons, but primary because we were all those people not that long ago, and we would do well to remember that. This is an, an elitist worldview. Now, if anyone could have justified having an elitist worldview, it was Jesus, and he didn't have it. Because Jesus wasn't an elitist, we don't get to be elitists either. The second thing we don't get to do is we don't get to indulge in the sins of the world and justify our actions by saying we're embracing their culture so we can reach their culture. It's so sweet sounding, but it's sinful. That's a cheap grace worldview. And we know that grace was not cheap. Grace was paid for with the highest of prices, the blood of God himself paid for our grace. And so we don't get to pretend like grace is cheap. We don't get to act like grace is cheap because we can't act like grace is cheap and also believe Jesus is who he says he is. We don't get to act like grace was cheap, full stop. We have a job and a role to do. And as we do it, we must be mindful to continue to live lives that honor Jesus. This is why Jesus does not pray that the Father would take us out of the world, even though living in a world that we're promised will hate us is really, really hard. Jesus then goes on to say, he said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Right? Jesus does not pray that we be removed from the world, but he also doesn't pray that we be left in the world with no support. Right? This is a central theme running throughout this prayer. Right? That those who believe would be kept, would be preserved from denying Christ. He said this back in verse 11, and he says it again. Here, he prays that believers would be kept from the evil one. Jesus prays that his believers would remain in the world, that they would be guarded, would be protected from the evil one. Jesus' prayer here is that while Christians would be in the world, they would be protected from attack, would be guarded, would be strengthened, and they would be shielded. Now, obviously, the, the evil one would attack with the intention of destroying both the life and and the ministry of the believer. Now, by attempting to destroy our lives, he can try to bring us, the evil one can try to bring us to the point of saying, why would Jesus allow this to happen to me? If he's allowing this, is he really who he says he is? By attempting to destroy our ministries, he wants to nullify our platform and our ability to spread the good news of the gospel to others, to share the love of Jesus. And by doing so, he can create more opposition for us, which can weaken our morale and quicken his ability to destroy our lives. Right? From a strategic standpoint, that's actually really smart. And I hate to give him credit, but strategically, it makes a lot of sense. Now, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to make a quick example, but I want to preface it with two things, because uh, it's, it's an example about uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, the first, I, I, I don't want you to hear me making light of the war in Ukraine. I, I abhor it, and I, I pray for its quick and speedy end and for justice to be served. Um, secondly, please don't get caught up on who is represented by who in my example. By doing so, you will have missed my point. Okay? 
So, with those prefaces, let's, let's do that. As Russia invaded Ukraine, the world at large sanctioned Russia. As the sanctions take effect, the, ro- the Russian economy is on the verge of collapse. With la- Last time I looked, the ruble was worth less than one U.S. penny. As the Russian economy becomes unable to support its populace, the Russian leadership will find it increasingly difficult to find support and and sway with its populace to support the continued war in Ukraine. In fact, as this becomes increasingly difficult, they will actually find themselves increasingly fighting a war on two fronts. The war that they've taken to Ukraine as well as the war against their own people at home as they refuse to sit idly by and watch their life savings turn totally useless and worthless in a matter of weeks. So they'll find themselves fighting a war on two fronts. This is the exact same battle plan of Satan. And this is why I don't want you to get caught up on who plays who in this example. If Satan can remove our ability to point people to Jesus, to bring people into the kingdom of heaven, then those who aren't being brought in remain citizens of the world, who remain citizens of the kingdom of darkness. And if those people who would have been brought into the kingdom of heaven are remaining as citizens of the kingdom of darkness, they remain as opposition. So rather than gaining support and and, and people to move the ball down the field, we're simply faced with more opposition. Okay? By doing so, it can make it dip more difficult for the believer to continue to stand and do the things we're supposed to do because we just feel like we're facing a wall of opposition that is not changing. The battle plan of Satan is unfortunately very clever. But This means that the creator of the universe is the one protecting us against the one against the one who tried to take the take out the creator and lost. The one who tried to take on the creator and lost is the one who's doing battle against us. Now, if I have to pick a side on that, I'm gonna pick the creator side because he wins. Right? The, the battles will rage and the battles, some will be won and some will be lost, but the war we know the outcome of. And those of us who stand on the side of the creator have won the war. It's done, it's over with, it's been settled and set in stone. Let's move on and look at verse 16. Jesus prays, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus says that those who believe in him have been fundamentally changed by their belief in him. This change has been so drastic that those who believe in him, their very nature has been changed to more closely resemble the nature of Jesus himself than the world around them. By stating that believers are not of the world, Jesus is stating that believers have a completely different nature. They have different fundamental goals, different core values, and ultimately a different God. You see, the world are not godless pagans. They just simply don't worship the same God we worship. Humans have been created by God with an innate desire to worship. And that desire to worship will be fulfilled, regardless of your belief system. So those who claim to be atheists, who do not believe in a God, they do still worship. They just don't worship the God we worship. So as the world around us does not worship the same God we worship. Maybe they've chosen to worship the God of money, the God of power, the God of sex, the God of success, the God of fame, or maybe just the good old God of self. These are the gods that the non-believers worship. Regardless of what God they have chosen, they are not godless. They just have decided to worship a different God rather than the one true God. When we are saved by Jesus, we are transferred and made citizens of the kingdom of heaven. When we become believers, we leave behind the gods we used to worship so that we can worship the one true God. 
as with any breakup, which is effectively what this is, uh, we have to set some hard boundaries. You don't get to worship the one true God, but then text the God of success at 2 a.m. you up. You don't get to do that. It's not good for you. All right, the God of success says that all things are okay if they help you get a leg up. So treat people as expendable. Ignore your moral compass. It's only illegal if you get caught. Your goal is to be on top of the ladder, no longer climbing it, and whatever gets you there is acceptable. Contrast that with the one true God who says in Matthew 20, 26 to 28, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. You can't rectify that. As scripture also says, you can't serve two masters. You don't get to serve the God of success and the God of or the, the one true God because those two gods are fundamentally different. And you can't treat people as expendable and expect to be served and also claim to be here to serve. You, you just can't. So what, what do we do with all of this? We see that Jesus has given us not only his teachings, but his entire life. Because we have received his teaching and his life, the world has hated us. However, even though the world hates us, it is not God's plan, nor does Jesus pray, that we would be taken out of the world. Instead, Jesus prays that we would remain in the world to influence the world for good and to point the world to Jesus. As we do that, he prays that we would be protected from the evil one who seeks to destroy our lives and our ministries. We are reminded that as believers, we are not of this world. Our nature has been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit to more closely resemble the nature of Jesus than the world around us. We have become members of his family. As Romans 8, 16, and 17 puts it, for the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. If we have been changed to share the nature of Jesus, to be counted as children of God, to be listed as co-heirs with Christ, if we're willing to accept the benefits of heirdom, we must also accept that doing so will lead to suffering as the world will hate us. However, as James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If we're going to accept heirdom, we've got to count it all joy. We've been called to a specific mission and to fulfill a specific role. If we as believers, as aliens, as foreigners, as outsiders in the world's eyes, are called to go into the world and to point the world toward Jesus, we are promised that we will face opposition we are promised that it will be hard. We are promised that we will face attack and hardship and trial. But we're also promised that we will not face those things alone. Jesus himself told his disciples, it is better that I go so that I may send the helper to you. Right, some people, I've heard people say, like, it would be so much easier to follow Jesus if I was living like, with the disciples. Because Jesus would be, I could always see Jesus. He was there. Like they, the disciples had Jesus with them. We get the Holy Spirit in us. I would prefer, because Jesus says it was better, I would prefer to have the helper, the very nature of Jesus himself, with me at all times, not simply sitting next to me at the table. And I, I don't want to discount having the physical Jesus with you. Like That's incredible. I'm jealous. But of the two, Jesus said this one's better. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to tend to side with Jesus. We are also promised that we have a hope in the future. So let us all do as we've been called by our Savior and God to do. 
And let us be in the world and not of the world. And being in the world means engaged with the world around you. Being in the world means you need to know people who don't know Jesus. If you can look around in your life and say everybody in this circle knows Jesus, then you need to meet some new people. Like, those people are great. Go meet some new folks. Right? Your job, above all else, is to point the world to Jesus. And if you've got no one to point, find some new friends. Be in the world. Engage with culture. Engage with the dead people around you. So that through the power of the Holy Spirit and your willingness to be the hands and feet of Jesus, those dead hearts can be made alive. But be careful that you're in the world and not of the world. That you're not using your requirement to engage culture as an excuse or a crutch to wink at sin. Remember, that we are called to put our sin to death and to be mindful of ourselves lest we fall victim to temptation. If you would, stand with me as we close the service. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come up. If, as I've been speaking, you felt the weight of the world on your shoulders, I'd like to invite you to come pray. If you feel that you're going toe-to-toe against the world by yourself, I'd like to invite you to come pray. If you're at a point in your life where you would really rather Jesus bring you home than allow you to stay in a world that is just beating you down, I invite you to come pray. If you know that Jesus has allowed you to remain in this world for a specific purpose, but taking the first step toward that specific pur- purpose terrifies you. I'd like to invite you to come pray. If you're having a hard time leaving behind the gods of your past, I'd like to invite you to come pray. If for the first time you would love to leave behind the gods you've been serving so you may serve and worship the one true God, I'd like to invite you to come pray. If you have a need or in a situation that has nothing to do with anything I've said today, then praise God he's bigger than me and can speak to you what he needs to speak to you. I'd invite you to come pray. The prayer team is here and available to you. If you'd like someone to pray with or for you. The front is open if you'd like to come and just pray by yourself. If you'd like to Go find someone specific to ask them to pray with or for you, or if you need to go pray with someone for them, that's available to you as well. For the next few minutes, we're just going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, to minister us, to do the things He wants to do. We commit this time to prayer. And I'll come back up and and close us out in a few minutes. But please, if you like prayer, it's available to you. As I was writing this sermon, uh, I didn't know what the set list for the day was going to be. But the line, we are his portion and he is our prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes, was circulating through my mind over and over and over again. I wanted to make it fit, but I couldn't find a way to make it fit really well, and I think this is why I couldn't make it fit. Jesus gave us the Word of God, both His teachings, His instructions, and his, His very life. And he, he was able to, able to say, I've given them your word because he gave all of him by shedding his blood on the cross. So we were his portion. We were the, we were the pain he had to take. 
I mean, the cross exists because our debt had to be paid. So we were the portion of Jesus, and in return for that, he is our prize. Because of him, we don't have to stare down the cross. We can stare down glory. But to do so, we do have to take up our cross. We do have to We do have to give up everything about ourselves. To surrender our entire lives to Jesus because that's what he deserves. And that's what he's called us. You don't get to you don't get to halfway follow Jesus. You're either in or you're out. He loves us. He made a way so that we can be reconciled to him. And then he decided to give each and every one of us that message and send us out into the world. We ought to be reminded that it wasn't all that long ago we didn't have that message. We didn't have that hope. We were of the world. So as we wrap up the service today and we we close things out, remember that to be in the world but not of the world and to point the world to Jesus. So when you leave here today and you go to lunch, let your actions and your words point your server to Jesus. Let your actions and your word point the cashier at Walmart to Jesus. Let your your actions and your word point your neighborhood to Jesus. And remind them, or tell them for the first time, that they are loved and they're invited. Jesus, we thank you We thank you that you have changed our nature from matching that of the world to matching that of you. God, we thank you that you've given us a role and a job to do. God, we thank you that you've chosen to use us as part of the the story and the history of redemption. God, we ask that we would not squander our role. God, that we would embrace it. That we would accept our marching orders and we would get to it. God, we pray that you would Embolden us, encourage us, strengthen us, and guide us as we remain in the world to influence it for good and to point the world to you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would go before us, you would embolden us, and you would light a fire under us. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, we're praying for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.